Hello everyone, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Josiah Crowman, I'm a mathematics and music double major here. If you didn't already know that, then you're probably in the wrong place, but I'm, I appreciate you being here anyway. Um, I'd like to formally welcome you to the Poorly Tempered Clavier, my senior honors project. Um, I'd like to extend a special welcome to my friends and colleagues from the, the math department. Um, my, my interaction with you has, um, has, has really motivated this project. So, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, probably the most important thing that I have gotten out of my mathematics degree here is um, a love for the question, why? I love to know not just how something works, but also why something works. Um, and recently I have really been uh, especially interested in the concept of arbitrarity. Arbitrarity meaning something that has been set as a default, something that has been chosen as a default um, without much reason. Um, so things like, you know, oatmeal is always flavored sweet for some reason. We've always chosen the flavor of oatmeal to be sweet, right? Why, why, is the, why is the speed limit 55 miles per hour instead of 57 or 58, right? Um, why should I study just one thing in college? Why can't I have more than one major? Or for that matter, why shouldn't I graduate in more than four years? Here we are, so I <laughs> and I'm having a great time. And a lot of these things, there's a lot of, there are, there are great answers to these questions, but understanding the answers to these questions can help us to apply what we learn in different contexts. As a musician, this has led me to ask a really important question, especially as someone who has been um, surrounded in Western music, modern Western music, all my life. I started to ask questions about our tuning system and why certain things are chosen as a default. So we live in a, we live in a world that's dominated by something called 12-tone equal temperament, which is when we take the octave and we split it up into 12 equal intervals. Now, I started to ask the question, what's so special about 12, and what's so special about equally spaced intervals? And that's really what motivated this project. Um, there, are, there are actually some very good reasons why we choose 12, and why we choose 12 equally tempered intervals. Um, but I really wanted to understand what the process was to get there. So in order to answer that question, we're going to work through four main sections. The first section, we'll talk about a couple of important terms that will be um, relevant to the rest of the presentation. Then we'll look through a historical review of Western music, Western intonation, to help us get to where 12 tone equal temperament came from. Then we'll talk about intonation in non-Western music. Right now in the year 2023, there are a lot of people around the world who are using systems other than 12 tone equal temperament. And then we'll look back in the modern Western world and look at a few examples of um, some people who are using non-12 tone equal temperament music. So we'll start out with an introduction, defining some important terms. Here's just a few quick definitions. Interval, we already talked a little bit about that. That's going to be the distance between two pitches. We as, as musicians um, love to think about that as a distance. But really what it is, is it's a frequency ratio. So our ears perceive pitch on a logarithmic scale. And what that means is that if I play an A down here, and then I play another A up here, the reason that those sound like the same pitch, the reason that we call both of those A, is because the frequency is doubled. So this is 220 hertz, and then this is 440 hertz, so then the next A above that would be 880 hertz. So while we might think conceptually about an interval as a linear scale, really what's happening is the frequencies are on a ratio basis, or on a logarithmic scale. So that's going to be really important talking about frequency ratios, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and then just some, some abbreviations here, MWM I use for modern Western music, um, and 12 tet, I'll use that to talk about equal temperament, 12 tone equal temperament. We'll all see a couple of other examples of, of equal temperament, we'll see 19, we'll see 31, um, some other interesting numbers there. And then we'll also introduce the concept of ascent. Ascent is 1% of a semitone, so a semitone will be this interval here. So that's the smallest interval that we can play on the piano, and so it's just helpful to have a, a way to, well, it's helpful to have a very small unit of pitch, so we'll talk about sense a little bit. Um, and just as a quick note, by convention, we will consider only ascending intervals, so that will just be represented um, by frequency, or by ratios where the higher number is first. So you can see there the example is three to two. We won't talk about two to three um, in this presentation, just for simplicity. Another important concept to talk about is the harmonic series. Um, 
the harmonic series in mathematics, um, a lot of, we as mathematicians are familiar with this series, which is the sum of unit fractions, so one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth. That's a mathematical object that we work with a lot. Um, and that's actually relevant to um, the other definition, which is the, in music, the harmonic series, is the sequence of pitches with frequencies of interval multiples of a given fundamental. So if I have a fundamental pitch with a frequency of 100 hertz, then the harmonic series on that fundamental is going to be 100, 200, 300, 400, etc. Um, we'll take a look at that in just a moment, but we'll, I want to mention that every single note has a harmonic series. So here's a picture of the first five members of the harmonic series based on C. Um, the series will extend infinitely and the intervals will get smaller and smaller. And that's because of that logarithmic definition of pitch. The way that we perceive pitch, remember it, the, the octave is going to be is going to be a doubling. So if I'm going up by integer multiples, then the interval is going to get smaller and smaller. Um, and then just some more terminology. Um, the, we call the members of the harmonic series partials. So that first pitch, like I mentioned, is the fundamental. The first partial is the fundamental. And then above that, we call them overtones. So we'll sometimes call it the overtone series. So relating to the mathematical harmonic series, um, this is a diagram explaining, um, explaining the way that vibrations will change in a string based on how you shorten the length of the string. So each member of the musical harmonic series corresponds with a different length of the string. So that first partial will be if you have the full length of the string, and then the second partial will be produced if you have the length of the string, third partial if you take the length of the string, the third, etc. Brass players are also very familiar with, the, with this idea, um, changing the embouchure, changing the way the shape of your mouth changes the, where, where you are in the harmonic series. It goes through the overtone. So it's really important to understand the harmonic series because it plays a huge part in the way that we perceive music. So in some situations, the overtones can be heard explicitly, especially if it's a really resonant room, like if you're in a cathedral or something like that. Certain instruments have very pronounced overtones. Um, but more importantly, timbre is determined by the amplitude of partials. So I mentioned that every note has a harmonic series. So every note is going to have the overtones going all the way up but the, the volume of each of those overtones is going to be different for each kind of sound. So the reason that you can tell the difference between a piano playing an A versus a cello playing an A is because it's not because the frequency is different, right? The, the frequency corresponds to the pitch of the note, but the, the presence of the overtones is going to be different in each of those different instruments. Some composers like to play with this idea. Maurice Ravel um, used the, this idea of parallel partials in his piece Bolero for the orchestra. Um, I, put the, I, I put an excerpt from the orchestra score up here in his concert pitch transposed. Um, and what's fascinating about what he does is that he takes this melody and then he orchestrates it in parallel partials, meaning that he takes the starting note of each of these five different instruments and he places them on the first five partials. Um, and so this results in some parallel octaves and some parallel fifths and fourths which create a really, really interesting sound. So let's go ahead and listen. You'll see that, it might be a little bit small, but you see we have celesta, we have horn, and we have two piccolos. Um, but when you listen to it, when the, the players are really, really well in tune, it almost doesn't sound like any of those instruments. It sounds like a brand new timbre. So let's go ahead and listen. fifth above, and it's a really interesting sound. You don't hear that. You don't hear that very often, but the way that Ravel uses it is just fascinating. Another concept that we're going to talk about is microtonality. Now, if you've read the poster, you've probably seen this word. If you've heard me talk about this project at all, you've definitely heard this word. Um, I'm super excited about this idea, um, and I want to talk about a couple different ways that we can define it, because I think that's really important. Commonly, this is, this is defined to be music outside of the 12 tone eagle temperament. The way that I've been explaining this to people is music in between the piano keys, right? Um, in, in 12 tone equal temperament, the piano is kind of the, the, the biggest way that we conceptualize music. But microtonality often refers to music that can't be played by the piano, it's in between the notes. Um, 
If you really break down the word, though, all it means is small tomes. And this is a this is an entirely relative term. And so the way that I like to define it is uh, microtonality is a system that uses pitches that fall outside of one's typical harmonic framework by making use of intervals that are smaller than those included in that framework. So for us, that does mean things that are in between the piano keys. But for somebody that comes from a different system, someone who has been completely uh, covered by the system that might be 10 tone equal temperament or 15 tone equal temperament, then you know their definition of what microtonality really means is going to be different. So with those definitions out of the way, we can go ahead and have a look at the history of Western intonation. Um, we will briefly fly through um, the way that we got to 12 tone equal temperament. Um, and for all of this, throughout this whole presentation, there will be more details available in the paper. So if you're interested in seeing that, you can go ahead and talk to me. Uh, we're still in the editing process, but that will be done before the end of the year. So we'll start out with Pythagorean intonation, which utilizes the simplest ratio, three to two. Talking about Pythagoras, a lot of us have heard the name Pythagoras. Many of us are familiar with his, his Pythagorean theorem, right? We know about, he loves triangles, but we also know that he loves numbers. Um, the, the way that Pythagoreanism, that philosophy, often gets described is using numbers to describe the natural world. So he really loves numbers, and he especially liked using small whole number ratios. Um, he was one of the first people to really look at intervals as a ratio of frequencies. Um, there's an apocryphal story about him um, listening to, to blacksmiths using different sized hammers to hit pieces of metal, and based on the weight of the hammer, he was able to figure out what the interval was. Now, we don't know if that story is really true, but the idea is that he was the first person to really start to think about intervals as frequency ratios. So the Pythagorean intonation system is based on the simplest whole number ratios, which are two to one, which is a pure octave, and three to two, which is a pure fifth. So these are the first two intervals in the harmonic series. So in general, we'll see this pattern that if whenever we're using frequency ratios, the smaller the number is, the earlier on in the harmonic series it's going to be, and generally the, the nicer it sounds to, to our ears, the more consonant that interval is going to be. So what, what the Pythagorean intonation system does is that it stacks these fifths and it makes octave adjustments to create a scale. So what I mean by stacking fifths, if I start at C, and then I go a fifth up from that, then I get G. So now I have C and G in my system, right? Now if I start at G and I go up another fifth from there, I get D, but that's outside of the octave that we want it, that we care about. So I'm gonna take that D and I'm gonna drop it down an octave. So now I have C, D, and G in very particular ratios. And then I can keep going. I can go all the way through just like that to create a full scale. So the diatonic scale um, is made, there's a lot of numbers up here, but really what's important is this over here on the end. The diatonic scale um, is created using multiples of that ratio of a fifth. Um, now this has a, a fairly unique sound, um, and I will play the scale for you. Listen very, very closely. It might sound, if you're not listening closely enough, it might sound normal, or if you're not, if you're not used to hearing these very minute tuning adjustments, it might sound normal, but if you listen very closely, it does, it will sound different from the piano. <laughs> So for me, the place that it really stands out is in those triads. And the, the reason that, that, that the triads sound different, that those chords sound, they sound wrong, um, very, very slightly wrong, we'll talk about later. So we can, we can expand the diatonic scale to a full uh, chromatic scale to all 12 pitches of the, chromatic, of the chromatic scale. And you might notice that we have both A flat and G sharp in this chart. And if you're familiar with 12 tone equal temperament, that seems pretty weird to you, right? Usually we think of A flat and G sharp as being the same note, right? If A and G are next to each other, then the note in between it should be A flat and G sharp. It shouldn't matter what we call it. But with Pythagorean intonation, this comes from the direction that we're stacking fifths, right? So if I start at D and I'm stacking up, 
I'm going to go D to A, then to E, B, F sharp. I'm going to have all the sharp notes above D. If I start at D and I stack fifths down, I'm going to go from D down to G to C to F to B flat and then all the flats below it. And so the reason that we have those different pitches is because the fifths stacking in different directions are going to come up with, with different notes. Um, the difference between A flat and G sharp is called the Pythagorean comma. This is about equal to 24 cents um, and it's very important, very small and important. So some difficulties with Pythagorean intonation is that the thirds are less than ideal, right? So I mentioned that those triads sound a little bit, sound a little bit off, and the reason is um, Pythagorean major thirds are, 80, are an interval of 81 to 64, which is a larger interval than the pure major third, which we get from the harmonic series of five to four. It's larger than by about 5.7%. Similarly, the minor third is flatter than a pure minor third by about 7%. Um, and so the thirds are going to sound a little bit, sound a little bit wrong, and especially when you have vocal music that's tuned into Pythagorean intonation, you can really, really hear something about the timbre of the human voice really makes those thirds stick out. The piano is a little bit harder to hear. Um, the difference between a Pythagorean third and a pure counterpart is 22 cents, which is called a syntonic comma. We'll come back to that later. Um, but I mentioned that we have that Pythagorean comma, that 24 cents. Um, it's the difference between two enharmonic tones, right? A flat and G sharp, we call those enharmonic notes because they're um, in 12 tone equal temperament, they're the same note. So that Pythagorean comma creates what's called a wolf fifth. So that, what, what, where that comes from is when you're stacking, what it, it, what it really should be is you stack 12 fifths that should be equal to seven octaves. That's how it works in 12 tone equal temperament. If I stack 12 fifths, it should come out to be exactly equal to seven octaves. But the problem is, Using pure fifths, 12, of the 12 pure fifths actually overshoots seven octaves by one Pythagorean comma. The other way to think about it is if I, have, if I stack up 11 fifths, that last interval is going to be a lot smaller than a pure fifth. And that interval, that last, that 12th smaller fifth is called the wolf fifth. And what that did was that rendered the, any key that, that had those, that fifth in it, it made it completely unplayable. But that wasn't really a problem in its historical usage. Um, during its mainstream popularity, which was for the you know, 15 centuries, first 15 centuries of, of modern music history, music, uh, composers were fairly content to just use perfect intervals. So you may have heard um, in music history that uh, you know at this time during pre-Renaissance that major thirds were considered a dissonance, right? Thirds were not considered a consonant pitch. And, or a consonant interval, and that was because they were using this tuning system and it sounded so wrong. So the solution to that was the next intonation system, which is called just intonation. This is usual, utilizing the harmonic series. So we'll introduce two definitions. We have a practical definition and a theoretical definition. The practical definition is just any tuning system that contains both both pure fifths and major thirds. And we'll say that if an interval is tuned to be pure, if it's tuned to be in accordance with the harmonic series, we'll call that justly tuned. The theoretical definition is uh, any tuning system that uses small whole numbers, that is using intervals early on in the harmonic series. So using that, pure, using that uh, practical definition, we'll look at the first example that we, that we know of, um, which is in this, uh, in a, a Spanish treatise called Musica Practica. Um, it's a great read. Julie Knott last week said that if you, you, should, you shouldn't ever read historical treatises, but I disagree. I think you should read them. <laughs> awesome. um, but the, in this treatise, Ramus, uh, Ramus describes this system where he, stacked, he started, by, started at A flat and he stacked fifths up to G. So he went A flat to E flat to B flat to F, C, and G. So he started with those six fifths, and then he took the next pitch, D, and he lowered it by a syntonic comma. So that would have created a wolf fifth from G to D. But then after that, he stacked pure fifths from D all the way up to C sharp. So D, A, E, B, F sharp, and C sharp. And that completed his 12 tone system. So while that might have created a wolf fifth, it also created a bunch of major thirds. So you see the, that superscript minus one refers to how many commas a note has been lowered. So this created pure major thirds between B flat and D, 
F and A, C and E, and G and B. Um, and so this was really helpful because those are all commonly used major thirds in keys that get played very often. Now this is essentially identical to Pythagorean intonation, um, except we take the wolf fifth and instead of putting it on the outskirts on an uncommonly used key, we put it right in the middle between G and B. So that makes any key containing that, uh, that, that perfect fifth, G to D, that makes those keys unplayable, but things like B flat major are going to contain B flat and D, which is, that's going to be very helpful um, as long as you avoid the G to D interval. So what's really important about this attempt is the intention. Um, it really showed that musicians of the time were moving toward what we call tertiary harmony. Tertiary harmony is harmony that is based on thirds, and that's a lot of the music that we hear now is, is harmony that is based on thirds. And so the fact that, that Ramis was creating a system that, um, that contained pure thirds, it showed the intention that he wanted to have thirds in his music. Um, this method continued to be relevant even 300 years later when Hermann von Helmholtz created a just harmonium. A harmonium is an is a, a organ. Um, it was a three manual organ, so it had three keyboards. And the first keyboard was Pythagorean intonation. Then the next one was Pythagorean intonation, except lowered by a comma. And then the third manual was lowered by two commas. And so what that meant was that he could, cr he could have pure thirds between the manuals. So if he has one hand on one manual and another hand on the next one up, then he can create pure thirds there. So the practical method is great, and it shows us the philosophy behind just intonation. But some formal categorization would be really nice. So what we'll do is we'll turn to some prime numbers. Prime numbers are a great way to categorize um, intonation systems. So we'll define prime limit tuning. If we're given some prime number p, then the p limit contains all rational numbers that can be factored using primes no greater than p. So what that really means is if I have a prime number, let's say 3, the 3 limit intonation system is going to be all of the intervals, all of the frequency ratios that can be factored using only 3 and 2. Those are the only prime numbers that we can have. So we've already seen that. That's Pythagorean intonation, right? Pythagorean intonation is created using intervals 3 over 2 and 2 over 1. And so if we're only ever using those two intervals, then it's always going to be factored with 3 and 2. So since Pythagorean intonation had all of those problems, the natural next step after Pythagorean three limit tuning was to move up to the next prime number, which is five. So five limit just intonation became the new standard. Now this is important because it contains both pure major and minor thirds. That five to four ratio and that six to five ratio are both included within five limit just intonation because both th all those numbers can be factored using two, three, and five. Those are the prime numbers we have access to. So we can create a diatonic scale um, in a couple of layers using just those intervals, a perfect fifth, a major third, and a minor third. So what we do is we start out with a chronic, we'll use C, and we add a perfect fourth and a perfect fifth above that. So now I have my tonic, I have my subdom subdominant, and I have my dominant. Right? So now from there, I put major thirds on all three of those pitches. So I start from tonic, and I add a major third that gives me access to E. I start from subdominant, and I add a major third above that that gives me access to A. And then I start from dominant, and I put a major third above that, which gives me access to B. So now I have C, E, F, G, and A, and B. All I'm missing is D, and so what I do is I have a perfect fifth above dominant, and that gives me access to the full diatonic scale. So here's a summary of that. There's just a chart showing all of the intervals. Um, you may notice a few things. Number one, there's two kinds of pulse sets, which I think is super cool. That's so fascinating. We have a major tone and we have a minor tone. The major tone is a 9 to 8 ratio, and the minor tone is a 10 to 9. And then, of course, we also have the semitone, which is 16 to 15. So we will go ahead and listen to that and we'll talk a little bit more about this system. So to me this one sticks out a little bit more. Sounds definitely sounds different from what we're used to. 
Um, to me, it, the third especially, that third scale degree sounds really, really flat. Um, but the reason that that is is because the pure major third is actually a little bit smaller than the, the major thirds that we're used to. Creates pure triad. The, 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 um, the, way, the reason that we, that we wanted to do this is because we have all these pure major thirds and it creates pure triads. We get pure triads on the first scale degree, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. So we have six pure triads, that, or sorry, five pure triads that are available to us. Um, the only thing that we that we can't use is the chord on the triad on the second scale degree. That second scale degree is going to contain the Wolf fifth. Um, so that triad is unusable, but five out of six is pretty good. <coughs> so we could continue and we could we could use that same method to create a full chromatic scale, but there's always going to be one sacrificial lamb, which is the wolf, right? There's always going to be some interval that is a wolf interval. And as chromaticism continued to develop, this required a different kind of system altogether. And that new kind of system is called temperament. Now temperament is a wholly new concept. It's completely different from any of, the, any of the systems that we've been looking at before. Up until now, pure fifths always reigned supreme, right? In Pythagorean intonation, we needed to have the pure fifth. And because of that, we ended up having bad thirds. So then we fixed that, we had bad thirds, or we had fixed thirds, but there were still wolf intervals, there were still unplayable keys, um, but those were just necessary byproducts. So the new idea was to temper or alter the fifth just a little bit so that the fifth was still acceptable, but that other intervals would benefit in a meaningful way. So what this did was this really demonstrated that thirds were now more important than fifths. The first known example was in Pietro Aaron's Toscanello, um, in which he flattened the fifth by a quarter comma so that the major thirds were all pure. So the reason that that worked was because if you stack four fifths on top of each other, the resulting interval is a major third. So if that interval is shortened by a quarter of a comma, then putting four of those intervals together will make up a full comma. So that major third was brought down by a full comma. So you can see that whole system up there, um, the full chromatic scale. <coughs> the other um, important aspect of this is that we now just have one kind of tone. There's no longer a major tone and a minor tone, um, one kind of whole step. And this whole step is going to be defined to be exactly half of a pure major third. Um, alternatively, it's the, it's the mean, it's the average of the major tone and the minor tone of five, five limit just in so that's where the term mean tone tuning comes from, um, is when you take, a, you take this mean tone interval and you use it to construct your whole system. Um, so this allowed for some degree of tertiary harmony, specifically with major triads, right? If you, if you look, any of the major thirds, the diatonic major thirds, are going to be flattened by a comma. So for instance, if we look at C to E, we have a superscript negative one on the E, meaning that the E is flattened by a comma, so a pure third from the, that'll make a pure third from C to E. You can go through and you can check all of the major thirds are going to be like that. The problem was that this wouldn't allow for any minor thirds, right? This was specifically for major thirds, because remember the minor third from just intonation was too small <coughs> and it needed to be wider. So this led to a couple of other mean tone-like temperaments. I put, I put air quotes around that because they're not strictly mean tone temperaments. There's no mean tone intervals, but some other common temperaments were third comma temperament, which is if, the, if what we just looked at was quarter comma temperament, where you flatten the fifth by a quarter of a comma, then the third comma temperament will be temper the fifth by a third of a comma, and it creates just minor thirds. Then two seventh comma temperament, we temper the fifth by two sevenths of two, two sevenths of a comma, and we end up kind of splitting the difference. The major third and the minor third, neither of them are pure, but they're both very, very close. Um, so this was, this was a, a very important temperament for a very, very long time, and I actually really enjoy music in this temperament. Um, there are some, some fascinating historical recordings. Um, and this was, this was um, the dominant temperament for a very, very long time. Um, as chromaticism continued to develop, though, we, we still needed um, some better solutions. So the problem with mean tone is that it struggled to play in very distant keys. So if, a, if an organ was tuned in C major, mean tone temperament, then 
maybe something like F major or G major would have been pretty, pretty well tuned, but the further you got from that, like if we go to try to get to D flat, then it's gonna be it's gonna sound really, really out of tune. So the next solution was well temperament. Now well temperament um, is really it's a large category, um, which is any temperament in which all keys are acceptably playable. Usually this is used to describe temperaments in which there's varying degrees of playability. So to use that same example of an organist tuned in C, if it's well tempered, well tempered, um, C major is going to sound really, really, really nice. And even something like D flat is going to sound nice, but it's going to sound less nice because the interval is going to be somewhat inconsistent. So the most important example of this kind of well temperament was a temperament called Berkmeister III. Andreas Berkmeister was a, a German theorist. Um, what he did was he distributed the comma among four of the fifths. So remember that that comma is the that's the problem with all these in, these intonation systems from before. Um, and so what he did was he took that comma, he split it into quarters, and then he he distributed that over these four fifths: C to G, G to D, D to A, and B to F sharp. And then he left the rest of them pure. So that's the difference between the mean tone temperament. Mean tone temperament it changes all of the fifths. That's what made that sort of inconsistency. Here, he only changes four of the fifths, which then allowed um, for some major thirds um, to be tempered by, by that comma. Um, what that, so what that did was it made all of the major thirds tempered by between one and four commas. Um, and so that, what that, that allowed for the more commonly played keys, things like C major and G major, it had a lot of thirds that would be tempered by just one comma while something like a G sharp major or A flat would be tempered by, by more commas. But what that did was that it created a system where all of the keys were at least somewhat acceptably playable. This is likely the temperament that Bach used, um, and so now we get to talk about the inspiration for the name of this project, right? This is the Well-Tempered Clavier. Um, this, is, this is Bach's most famous, uh, possibly his most famous work for, for the piano or for keyboard instruments. It's a, a set of preludes and fugues in all keys. Um, he was known to embrace the individual character of each of the keys. So um, even though all of the keys were acceptably playable, um, they were all different. All, there was always a little bit of inconsistency in the way that those different triads and intervals um, interacted with one another. And Bach was known for embracing that and not rejecting it. So when you listen to the music, if you have a really, really good understanding of well temperament, um, it, you can really, really tell how it influenced his compositional style. Um, so now we're going to play a little bit, game, a little bit of a game. Um, we're going to listen to Bach's famous C major prelude. If you don't know what that is, you'll hear it and you'll know what it is. Um, and we're going to listen to it in three different keys. Um, these are all separated by a half step. Um, and this is tuned to well temperament. So it's not just that we change the starting note. Um, but it's going to take on the individual characteristics of each of the keys. Um, if you have perfect pitch, you're not allowed to play. Sorry, um, but we'll listen to the three, and we'll see if you can guess which ones, um, which one is the correct. One of them is correct. Two of them are wrong. <laughs>
But people always were able to justify why they liked a certain key better than the other. It wasn't just an arbitrary choice. People always had a reason for why they liked it better. So don't feel bad, Connor, that you chose C sharp major. Um, <laughs> it, it's a unique sound, and you know, music is subjective. Art has no rules. So the problem with well temperament, right? Well temperament was really important to Bach. It was really important in the Baroque era. But then as chromaticism continued to develop more and more and more and more into the Romantic era and beyond, um, we start to have a lot of modulations going on. That means key changes, right? The key center, the tonal center changes so much that well temperament just was no longer enough. Um, each of the inconsistencies between the keys, that's fine if you're gonna change keys maybe once or twice in a piece, but if you're gonna have 10 modulations throughout a symphony, then the inconsistency is really gonna start to bother your ear. So that led to a brand new system called equal temperament, and that is the system that we now live in. <coughs> so Werkmeister, the, the man that um, invented that, that first um, important well-tempered well -tempered system, um, eventually became an advocate for 12 tone equal temperament as an alternative. Um, the earliest known mathematical figures that we have been able to find go back to 1584 in China and 1585 in Belgium. Um, but the fully calculated system was pu finally published in 1715. And this was huge because the mathematics was very, very difficult to figure out the integral ratios of uh, equal temperament. And that's because of that, logarith that logarithmic perception of pitch that we've been talking about. Um, the ratio of an equally tempered semitone is exactly equal to the 12th root of 2. So you can go ahead and try to do that by hand and see how important this, this calculation was that they did in 17. Um, we'll talk about a few other equally tempered systems later on. Um, but that's how we got to 12 tone equal temperament. We went from Pythagoras to five limit just to mean tone to well temperament and equal temperament. And as always, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of messy details in between. It was never a clean transition. Um, if you're interested in reading more about that, you can see that in the paper. But now we're gonna look, we're gonna change gears and look to some non-Western examples. Um, I wish I had time to look at more than just two, but we will just look at Indian music and Byzantine chant. So starting with Indian music, um, Hindustani Shastriya, which is a, a translates to North Indian classical music. This system is based on swara and truti. So the scale is built up of swara. Um, that's what, how they call their notes. So there's seven shuddha swara, which are diatonic. That's like non-altered. There's no flats or sharps on it. And then there's five variants. Um, so those, those swara are sa, ra, ga, ma, pa, da, and ni. And then re, ga, da, and ni all have como variants, which means flatter. Um, and then ma has a sharper variant, which is called a tibra. So when we put all 12 of those variants together, we have the full chromatic palette. So we see how 12 shows up even in India, where they're not looking at all at this uh, you know, the mean tone system and the 12 tone equal temperament. That whole thing, that whole process happened in Europe. But in India, they also use the number 12, and that's because that 12 fifth, the, the harmonic series coming out. 12 is a very important number in the harmonic series. <coughs> they use what's called a natural tempered scale. So um, sa and pa are the only fixed pitches. All the rest of them operate within a range called swarakshetra. Um, there's a very narrow range that you can sort of, there's wiggle room for each of those pitches. Um, the upper and lower limit of the Swarakshetra is called Shruti. Now Shruti, <coughs> there's 22 Shruti in an octave. They call that a septoc. There's 22 Shruti um, because we have, like, there's, there's 10 pitches that each have two Shruti. And then those, uh, those two pitches, um, Sa and Pa are both Shruti within themselves. So that makes 22. Um, but it's important to note, this is not 22 tone equal temperament because there's actually space in between the Swarak Shetra. So here's a diagram that I found pretty helpful. Um, you can see each of those sort of the squiggle highlight, highlighted areas are where the pitches exist, right? And we have the, the long vertical lines are gonna be the uh, Sa and Pa. And then in between those, we have these little ranges where each of the pitches can exist. Um, and then you can also see that there's space in between the Swarak Shetra, right? Something like in here, a pitch that falls in that space would be considered out of tune. But anything in here is going to be considered in tune. 
Now we have this concept of uh, rog. Um, you may have seen this term raga, which is an anglo anglicized version of the term rog. Rog is a set of notes in ascending and descending order, um, each with certain characteristics. So uh, aroha and avaroha, that's our like, ascending and descending set. Um, they can have the same pitches or they can have different pitches. They can also have different numbers of pitches. Um, so sort of going up and going down, the scale might be different. Each rag also has a chalan. Chalan is um, the principle of having two most important pitches. You have the sort of most important and the second most important. Um, it can be any two pitches, but it has to be in separate halves of the octave. So if I have, if my most important pitch is in the lower half of the scale, then the second most important pitch has to be in the, the upper half of the scale, and vice versa. So in Western music, we have an analog, the tonic dominant axis. Um, that's this idea that the first and the fifth scale degree are the most important. Um, even if you're not familiar with that term, you have heard it in music. Anytime that you hear something like this, that's the, an expression of the tonic dominant axis. I'm going from the dominant chord to the tonic chord. Right? It feels resolved to us. That's the idea of the tonic dominant access, axis. Now in rock, um, it can be any two pitches. It's a lot freer than the tonic dominant axis. It creates a lot of opportunity <coughs> for harmony. Each rod also have, has different customary ornamentation to go on each note. Um, so there's, there's hundreds and thousands of different kinds of rod where you take a scale, right, and then you, on top of that scale, you pick two important pitches, and then you add in ornamentation. When you put all of those together, it creates a lot of possibilities. So we're going to listen to um, a recording by Kaushiki Chakraborty. She's singing Ranga Sari Gulabi. Um, I can't remember the name of the rag, but this is just this is the rag that she specializes in, and she shows her mastery and ornamentation through this recording. <laughs> Sliding, there's a lot of really, really small intervals. There's turns, and she's you know showing her vocal dexterity within um, the context of the ornamentation that's appropriate for that rock. Um, so I think it's a really, really beautiful tradition. There's so much out there. There really is. Someone has estimated there's about 400,000 rock. Um, so that's different scales combined with talan, combined with ornamentation. When you think about all the possible combinations, it makes sense that there's going to be you know, that many distinct sets. <clears throat> so now we'll look to our next example, which is Byzantine chant. Um, I'd like to shout out thank you so much to Mike Lazar. Um, he really, really helped me out with this section. Um, <clears throat> so in Byzantine music, they also have scales. Of, they have a diatonic scale of seven notes. Um, mi, pa, mu, ga, di, ke, and zo. Um, and he would make fun of me for not putting the Greek lettering up there, but I didn't want to try and figure that out. So they have this concept of morea. Uh, morea are units of pitch. So they break down the octave into 72 equally spaced units. Um, so that's about six, that is exactly a sixth of a semitone, which is about 17 cents. Um, and then the number of morea is going to vary between each note um, based on which scale you're using. So here are the four different scales. And I have audio recordings, but we're going to skip them for time's sake. <coughs> But you can see um, the number of morea in each scale um, is going to be different. So, for instance, this diatonic scale will play just one of them. The di diatonic scale um, is going to have this, the 10 and the 8 are going to sound pretty wrong to us because remember, uh, a sixth of a semitone is a morea. So we're used to only hearing sixes and twelves, right? But as soon as we see a 10, that's going to sound like a strange interval to us. So here's the diatonic scale. So you can hear the the bu, the bu and the zo sound really really flat to us, right? It sounds that's a third of a semitone flat, um, but that's that's the system that they use, and so we see there's all these other scales as well. <coughs> On top of that, we have concepts called attractions. So each scale degree is going to have different guidelines for it, for which pitches lean in different directions in different contexts. So what that means is 
Um, you know, we might have, in the diatonic scale, we might have the distance between pa and vu is going to be 10 morea, but that might not always be the case. So in the diatonic scale, pa is going to be attracted to vu unless pa is a cadence point. So depending on where in the music it is, pa might be a little bit sharper even than what, it's, what it looks like on, the, on paper. And we have all of these other um, different attractions. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see that there's a lot of complexity there. For each different scale, there's different guidelines like this. This note is attracted to that unless it's a cadence point. This note is attracted to that um, when it is a cadence point, things like that. Then another layer is we have genres and ecclesiastical functions. So scales will function differently based on the genre. Um, the genre is a rhythmic signature corresponding with functions in the liturgical calendar. So that talks about um, how many syllables or how many beats go with each syllable. So something like the yermologic genre is going to have one to two beats per syllable, but the papadic genre is going to have anywhere between one and 20 beats per syllable. Um, and they choose the genre based on what's appropriate um, in, the, in the church service for, for that day in the liturgical calendar. So <clears throat> the other thing about that, about genres, is that it impacts the cadence points. Um, and remember that cadence points impact attraction. So the yermologic genre, for each of their eight modes that they have, which is based on the scales, um, each, each mode is going to have three different genres, yermologic, decoratic, and papadic. And each of those is going to have different cadence points. So uh, each, of the genre, each of the modes have different genres, and each of the genres have different cadence points, and each of the different cadence points have different attractions. There's layers on layers on layers on layers of different pitch alterations that we can make here. So it ends up being what we, what we think of as very microtonal music, because based on all of these different guidelines, they can be operating anywhere within the scale. So here's a brief example. Um, this starts in the diatonic scale, and then it actually switches, it's a mode mixture, switches into the enharmonic, or into the uh, chromatic scale. <laughs> So now that we've looked at these non-Western examples, we'll switch into our last section, which is microtonality in modern Western music. Um, we'll look at a few examples of that. The first person, Perry Parch, um, thanks to Dr. Colonna for introducing me to this man. Um, absolutely brilliant, really kooky, but absolutely brilliant. Um, he was an enemy of equal temperament. He hated temperament. Um, he picked up music from a very young age, um, he was playing piano, he was composing in his teenage years. Um, and he was a strong believer in practice over theory. He felt that the sound of the music was way, way, way more important than anything that you could write out on paper. Um, he believed that temperament was a betrayal of the ear. He thought that if we're, if we're tempering the fifth away from what it has in the harmonic series, then that is a problem. Um, and so he recognized that there was that there were problems with three and five limit just intonation, which before then, the solution was a mean tone temperament, well temperament, and eventually 12 tone equal temperament. But his solution was rather than tempering, he just used a higher limit. So he tried seven limit just intonation, and it didn't create enough new intervals for him. Um, and so he went ahead and went up to the next prime number, which was 11. 11 limit just intonation led to the creation of a 43 tone scale, which he called the Genesis scale. Now this is not 43 tone equal temperament. Parch would have absolutely despised the idea of 43 tone equal temperament because remember, he doesn't like temperament at all. He's all about just intonation. Um, and so there's all of these little different intervals that create a lot of different um, triads, which are again 
chords of three notes, tetrads, which are chords of four notes, um, create a lot of possibilities, as you can imagine. So we'll go ahead and listen to him playing on his uh, reed organ, which he called the chromolodeon. And let's see if you can count them with me. <laughs> So some other composers will opt for an alternative tuning system. So rather than just including one little instance of that, like a pitch bend, you have someone like John Adams in his violin concerto, the Dharma at Big Sur. Um, he, in his introduction of this piece, um, he wrote that the real meaning of the music is in between the notes. So he wrote it for electric violin, which allowed for a lot of possibilities of um, pitch slides and things like that. And then he also tuned the orchestra to just and there's a piece by Jeremy Ligeti by, uh, called Ramifications, where he takes a string ensemble of 13 players and he splits them kind of in half. Six of them will play in normal A equals 440, regular tuned alternative accompaniment. The other seven will be tuned 50 cents above that. So the other seven are a quarter tone higher. So half of a semitone. So it sounds really, really, really dissonant. It creates a lot of brand new intervals. Um, it was described as being mistuned rather than microtonal. That was his intention, was to create this brand new kind of sound. Um, and then other composers, rather than trying to put it into a system, they just scrap the organization completely and they um, just they throw in whatever they want. So Ronald L. Caravan has this absolutely gorgeous soprano saxophone piece called Echoes of a Crimson Twilight where you use extended techniques and alternative fingerings to get microtonal pitches. Um, and in doing this, he, he takes this microtonal vocabulary and then he puts it into the typical ideas of melodic construction. So he, he, they're, they're really, really beautiful melodies, he's just using a different kind of vocabulary. 
So beyond modern classical music, there are actually some niche corners of popular music um, which use microtonality. Um, so first we're gonna talk about um, microtonal stride piano. This video that came across my YouTube recommended page a year and a half ago, this was, that is the reason that I'm standing here right now. This got me so excited about microtonal music. Um, so this, this YouTube music musician by the name of Mike Vitalia, um, he makes jazz covers in 31 tone and 19 tone equal temperament. Um, so we've mentioned that a little bit before. The reason that 31 and 19 are such special numbers is that 31 tone equal temperament actually comes very close to approximating quarter comma mean tone temperament. And then 19 tone equal temperament comes very close to third comma temperament. Um, and so because those mean tone temperaments resulted in 12 tone equal temperament, a lot of the musical ideas also follow that. And so um, Western music, this 12 tone equal tempered music can then be played in 31 tone equal temperament um, fairly compatibly. And then there's also, of course, a lot of mean thing involved. Um, so what's really special about what he does here is that he takes um, musical constructs that we use in 12 tone equal temperament, things that only work because of enharmonic equivalence. So um, things like the fact that E sharp and F we, in 12 tone equal temperament are the same note that allow us to do things like tritone substitutions and augmented sixth chords and things like that. Um, and so what he does is he takes those and then he puts them into a context where enharmonic equivalence is not a factor. Um, so it's really, really musically creative and it creates a lot of cool sounds. So here is just a short, uh, short excerpt from his cover of Sweet Lorraine in 31 tone. He has access to an extra third that's right in between those two pitches, which is, if you heard, he was playing it up high, um, that note that might have sounded a little bit out of tune, that's what that was. Now, of course, no, no discussion of microtonality in the modern world of music is complete without mentioning Jacob Collier. Um, he's, he uses microtonality often. He, he has a lot of melodic runs in his voice that go outside of falsette. Um, he also often tunes chords within each other justly, so um, that's a concept called intonalism. If you're an instrumentalist, you've probably heard this before, where in a major chord, you want the third to be a little bit flat, and you want the fifth to be a little bit sharp. And the reason that that is, is because this major third is 400 cents, but a justly tuned major third is 386 cents. So you want to tune it just a little bit lower so that it's in line with the harmonic series. So Jacob Collier uses that all of the time. And then on top of that, he iconically modulates to the key of G half sharp major in his cover of In the Bleak Midwinter. So we'll take a look at that briefly. Here's the, a brief, a short transcription of that modulation that he uses. Um, so the way that he does it is way over here, he, he, he calls it his four magic chords. Way over here, we're still tuned in normal A plus 440. This is um, using the key of E major over here. By the time you get to this chord here, you can see we have a half sharp here. This is a D half sharp seven chord with a bunch of extensions, right? So what he does is that for each of these chords, he just raises it just a little bit. He makes it a little bit higher, a little bit higher. He's, he's changing his tuning system. The tuning system is getting a little bit higher and a little bit higher until he gets to the modulation when he's just in a brand new key, which is G half sharp major. So we'll listen to that modulation real quick.
doing that one more time, and I'm going to play a G major chord on the piano to hear how different this is. This is brand new. This is, it's unbelievable what he does. <laughs> especially here, if you listen for that top note, um, you can hear the D, the solo, it's going to drop ever so slightly. If you listen really, really closely, you can hear him going along with the changing in the tuning. So, I think that this is pretty much the coolest thing in the entire world. Um, <laughs> I, it has been such a phenomenal experience working on this project, um, because as a pianist, right, I should love 12 tone equal temperament, and I do. My instrument doesn't work without 12 tone equal temperament. Um, but it has been so fascinating to me to learn about music that is outside of this, right? The music that led up to the creation of the 12 tone equal temperament piano or music that's being played and created outside, you know, right now, in the year 2023, outside of this system. It's been an incredible experience. So here are just a few acknowledgements you can read through that. Um, <clears throat> but I just wanted to briefly thank Dr. Kalana for being my research advisor on this. Thank you for, for your grace and for your motivation and encouragement um, and for just knowing so much. You always have something to say that, um, that makes me think and gets me excited. Um, thanks to my family for supporting me and listening to me talk about this nonsense for over a year. Um, and for my friends for supporting me. I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Um, there will be time. I have the, the atrium reserved. If you have any questions for me, I'd love to talk about it. But we're at an hour now. So thank you all for being here. Appreciate it.